We appreciate our visitors that are here tonight. And I hope that you'll get something from the service that will encourage your heart. Those of you that are uh, fit for God's service, I pray that you'll be about your Father's service. You'll not just talk about fishing, but you'll go fishing. And those of you that are uh, not where you ought to be, uh, this is a good place to get where you ought to be. We still believe in an altar. We don't, we, don't, we don't understand any virtue that's in this wood, but we do understand that there's virtue in you humbling yourself before God and before the public and confessing publicly the Lord Jesus Christ. Greatest thing I ever done in my life, whenever I stood up that night and said, Jesus, save me. Didn't have a whole lot to say. I've had a lot to say since then, but that night all I could get out was I'm saved. That's, that's all we need to get out. Thank God. All right, in the book of 1 John, chapter 1. The book of 1 John, chapter 1. I'll start reading there at verse 4. 1 John, chapter 1, verse 4. And these things uh, we write unto you that your joy may be full. That's what... That's what preacher's desire is that you'd be a happy Christian. Any shepherd's happy when the flock's happy. Amen. These preachers all the time fussing and fighting with their flocks. They're not happy and the flock's not happy. But it's our desire that your joy may be full. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. None. If we say that we have fellowship with Him, and walk in darkness, we lie, and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us, From all sin. Hallelujah. Some of those things aren't in there. I'm just saying them. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, We make him a liar, and his word is not in us. I want to zero in on verse 9 tonight. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Sin is a transgression of the law of God. Sin is anything or any time that you know to do good and don't do it, that's sin. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Sin is that action in man's soul that builds a wall between him and God. It results in some deed, but it starts long before the deed is ever done, whenever you decide in your soul to break the commandment of God. To the law, sin is the barrier between them and God. And the barrier between the lost and heaven and the barrier between any permanent joy here on the earth. Sin is a terrible thing. Most folks have forgotten that it's even in the English language. No one wants to be called a sinner. Anytime they are told that they are a sinner, they get upset. Well, you just might as well get upset. Because the Bible said if we say we have no sin, we make him a liar. And God is not a liar. Every man you see can be a liar, but God is not a liar. God is truth. Let's pray before we talk about confessing our sins. Our Heavenly Father tonight, Lord, I thank you for uh, forgiveness of our sins. That we have the redemption that's in the blood of Jesus Christ. Lord, the forgiveness of our transgressions. God, I just pray tonight that you'd help us as we go to preach that we may be an encouragement to someone. And Lord, that they may see the reality of getting right with God. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Amen. Sin is the problem. Sin is the trouble. Sin is what will send you to hell. The easy believism people tell us that people go to hell because they reject Jesus. Uh, that's not true. Listen to me. If that were true, then I'd never send a missionary across the wall. If that were true. Because see, if they've never heard of Jesus, they can't reject Jesus. You do not go to hell for rejecting Jesus. You go to hell because you are a sinner. Amen. You understand that? You're a sinner in the sight of God. Yeah. And why we send missionaries out, why preachers preach, is to get across to you that sin is a destructive agent that will damn your soul, destroy your home, destroy your body, and kill you before it's finished. People go into eternal damnation where their tormented souls cry for water amidst a flame that will never, ever, ever, ever be quenched from which they can never escape because they are guilty sinners in the sight of God. Understand that we need to bring that word back into the vocabulary of America. We need to quit making excuses for it and we need to let people know that sin will send you to hell. The gospel is the good news that God has done something about our sins. Amen. Jesus Christ was nailed to the cross of Calvary and suffered and bled and died so that He could buy my redemption from my sins. Hallelujah. Man, that ought to make anybody of any denomination that's saved, that ought to put a, a shout in their heart to know that their sins are gone. To the law, sin is the undoing uh, uh, that will put them hell. To the Christian, sin is the hindrance to your progress for Christ. Sin detours your joy. Sin wrecks your havoc on your lives, your home, and your testimony. So the best thing we can do is get rid of it. Amen. Like the old country preacher said, what did he preach on? said he preached on sin. said, how did he think of it? He said he didn't like much of it. Amen. Amen. Didn't think much of it. We don't need tonight to think much of it. Some say they have no sin. Verse 8 says you're just deceiving yourself Amen. if you say you have no sin. Verse 10 says you make God a liar. But this same book says if we will confess our sins that He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What a deal. I mean, Monty Hall couldn't offer a box like that. What a deal that my sins can be gone forever. A Christian never needs forgiveness. Watch this. A Christian never needs forgiveness from God's point of view. I need, I need to make that clear so you'll understand where we're coming from. He is already, if he is saved, he is already forgiven. Amen. Amen. For everything that you ever did was paid for at Calvary. Understand that. There was a time when God would bring sins back up. The book of Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 3 said every year whenever they would offer that blood of the bulls and goats that there was a remembrance made. God remembered that those people were sinners and God demanded that they bring another sacrifice. The Bible teaches the reason that they had to keep coming with sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice was because the blood of bulls and goats could not take away sin. Amen. Amen. Remembrance was made. But thank God when Calvary uh, occurred on this planet, the Lord Jesus bowed His head, said, It is finished. No more sacrifice for sin forever. As far as God is concerned, Calvary is the final deal. Amen. And you are forgiven. Thank God. If you believe what I'm telling you, you are forgiven from God's standpoint. Sins are forever gone. Forever gone. Hebrews chapter 8 verse 12, their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Isn't that what the Bible said? Am I telling you something that isn't in there? That's God's standpoint. But now man doesn't see it that way. 
You know what David said in Psalm chapter 51 verse 3? Yeah. David said, my sin is ever before me. Yeah, right. See, there's man's point and God's point. Yeah. If you are guilty, anytime you hear the preacher preaching, your sin will come up. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Thank God, but in heaven it doesn't work that way. Yeah. But, but from our viewpoint, from man's viewpoint, there's all, there's a, there's a sin, there is a sin problem. But thank God there's been something done about it. And if we'll confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. There is a natural process that we call sowing and reaping. And a, a, an illustration that I want to use is God has got... Uh, cycles that he uses on the earth. I don't know whether you knew that or not, but the weatherman doesn't control the weather. God's in control of the weather. And the Native American, he was smart enough to look along the river bank and see where the trash come to. And he wouldn't pitch his teepee there. Now the people in Louisiana is dumb enough to build a whole city below the river level. You know what you're saying when you do that? You're actually challenging God. You're challenging God. You, we're stronger than you, and the Mississippi will never take us away. Yeah, right. Amen. They did that for a hundred years in New Orleans, Louisiana. Yeah. But one day God sent Hurricane Katrina that way, and He taught them that it's foolish for you to build below the waterline. Yeah, right. Would you agree with that? Yeah. What I'm saying tonight, it's foolish for you to build below the sin line. Even though, even though God has forgotten it, ever so often the judgment comes rolling by. And if you're caught below the sin line, brother, the judgment is coming your way. Amen. Does that make sense to you? It's just a natural process. I'm not, saying that, I'm not saying that God doesn't control the natural forces. But I'm simply saying that if you sin, you'll not get by with it forever. Oh, you may get by with it once or twice. You may get by with it to the point that you think, hey, I'm pretty good at this. I'm pretty slick. God's never going to judge me for that. Don't kid yourself. God's got a judgment coming. God's law says ever so often judgment is coming. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 31. If we would judge ourselves, we'd not be judged. So if I'm living below the water level and I say, hey, man, this is kind of foolish. And I get out from under the water level and when the judgment comes, the water level stay in the same, but I've moved. I've judged myself. I'm going to get around to this confessing our sins in a minute. Judgment is lifted when we move to higher ground. Is that right? I mean, he set a boundary for the sea. He set a boundary for the, for the rivers. He set a boundary for the lakes. And as long as we will stay away from that boundary, we're in good shape. If we confess our sins and to con confess it and to admit are two different things. Uh, George Washington, faced with his sin, you know what he said? I cannot tell a lie. I chopped down that cotton picking cherry tree with my little axe, my little hatchet, something like that, if I remember. I don't know whether they still teach that in school or not. I knew a man that, that I brought to church with me several times that was a drunkard. And he thought that just because he would admit it, that that was all there was to it. No, something's got to be done about it. Amen. Amen. He, uh, admission is not forgiveness. You know when George Washington could get forgiven? Whenever he took the same view of them cherry trees that his daddy took up. Amen. You understand what I'm saying? To just run around, hey man, I'm the guy that chopped your tree down. That's like saying I'm the guy that robbed your bank and thinking you're free. You're not free just because you admit it. Amen. Amen. The word, and if I can remember this, I'm just going from my memory now. The, the Greek word, y'all like that? That makes me sound professional. The Greek word uh, for confess is homologous. And I don't have to tell you what homo means. Y'all have been exposed to enough of that already. That means the same. Yeah. But the word logos 
or logo or logos. That means word. Now, now, America has corrupted it to mean logic. But that's fine if you want to take logic. So what we've got, the word confess then means for you to use the same logic about your sins as God uses about your sin. For you to say the same thing about your sin as God says about their sin. Now we've got a group, and I'm not trying to throw rocks, I'm just preaching the book. But we've got a group that'll go out on Saturday night and get drunk and a skunk, and then they'll go in on Sunday and they'll confess, hey, I got drunk last night. Yeah. And somebody will say, well, you do ever how many Hail Marys or whatever they're supposed to do, and your sins will be forgiven. Not so, friend. Yeah. Listen to me. Listen to what I'm telling you. Your sin will never be straightened out until you feel about your sins the way God feels about your sins. Yeah. And if you got plans on going back on Monday and doing the same thing you've done on Saturday, you're wasting your time of going in a little booth and confessing your sins to a man. Amen. To confess our sins is to use the same logic that God uses about our sins. To lay down or throw away your defenses of your sin and name it the way God names it. For me to throw away my defenses and say, God, I'm the one that's in need of prayer. Of course, I'm aware that many of you are good Baptists and, and y'all tithe and don't sin. I'm aware of that. This week you haven't done any wrong and you don't even need this sermon. I don't know why you're here. I guess maybe just to encourage all the sinners that do need it. After all, number one, your sin wasn't that bad. Amen. <laughs> Or number two, if it was bad, it wasn't your fault. Yeah. Or number three, you had a bad day and you were sick and you was tired and, yeah. and uh, they made me do it. Yeah. That's three through five, I think. Number six, okay, I was wrong, but so were you. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. How about that? Once in grace, always in grace. Yeah. I'm not, don't kid me, man. I've been around these babies too long. I know what they say. The truth of the matter is they're trying to hide their sin and you cannot hide sin in the sight of God none of those are compatible with confession if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins but none of those are saying hey I've got the same attitude about my sins as God has about my sins there's no joy in the Christian life until its goals are in tandem and in time with the goals of God did you know that's why so many unhappy Christians, Amen. they're running wrong all week long. They're out of sync with God. Yeah. Amen. They come in here and they get blame the preacher and vote the preacher out and get another preacher in that'll tickle their ears. And it, The problem is not with the preacher. The problem is with the repenter. We don't have any. Yeah. There is happiness in fellowship that is advanced beyond this veil of tears. There is happiness in knowing that beyond this valley of sin and death, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And we're here for the sole purpose of glorifying our God. Amen. Sometimes the Christian's life belies their profession. Would you agree with that? Sometimes their mouth serves God. That's all. How can we tell? We do not need to go to our buddy and say, do you think I was wrong? Amen, preacher. Come on. We do not need to go to some sociologist. Yeah. And we certainly don't need to contact Dr. Phil Amen. or Oprah or Amen. Jerry Springer yeah. and tell them what we've been up to and ask them if they've got a final thought on what our sins ought to be. Amen. Verse 5, the Bible said God is light. Yeah. I, want, I want to dwell on that. In Psalm 119, verse 130, the Bible said, The entrance of thy word giveth light. John 1, 4, in him was life, and his life was the light of men. John 3, 19, light has come into the world. John 3, 20, everyone that doeth evil hateth the light. Ephesians 5, 13, things reproved are made manifest by light. 
Jeremiah 10, 23, it is not in man to direct his steps. We do not know how to walk, but God has gave us a light in the world that we can follow the light and we can know how to walk correctly. A man can't see in the dark. Would you agree? As the sun is to the natural world, so this book is to the spiritual world. This book is is a light to my path. Amen. This book is a lamp to my path, a light to my feet. This book will show me what is right and what is wrong. And if I go any other source other than that old book, then I went to the wrong place. Fellowship with God involves walking in the light. Didn't I first read there, God is light and in him is no darkness. Didn't I read to you if a man says he has fellowship with God and walks in the dark, he's a liar. Fellowship with God involves walking in the light. We walk in the light by reading God's book. That is the ultimate authority on what's right and wrong. Legislation of America is not. The conscience of uh, of most people put together is not. Uh, The the uh, latest psychological surmising is not. The light that we can walk in and know it's true is the book of God. The Bible said heaven and earth will pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Amen. Is it light or is it dark? The only way we can tell is by looking in that book. Because yes. see, if we leave it up to you, you and leave it up to me, we get all kind of answers. Yeah, that's right. I'm not even going to ask the questions. I don't want to get somebody stoning me here tonight. But there's all kind of answers. But the answers don't line up with the book. Yeah. And when the answers don't line up with the book, it's dark and not light. Amen. When we perceive that our deeds do not line up with God's book, we confess that we are sinners and our job is to return to the light. Amen. God's book says, watch this. God's book says, keep my commandments. Yeah. Isn't that what it said? Yeah. I see them fences went up right there. Uh-huh. I didn't say that. 1 John chapter 2, verse 3 said that. Yeah. Keep my commandments. The end of every commandment that God ever gave is love. Love your God and love your neighbor and you won't have any problem keeping Amen. the commandments of God. Yeah. 1 John chapter 5, verse 3 says it's not even a burden. It's not grievous. It's not hard to keep His commandments if you're walking in the light. But you see, the reason it seems so hard for us to keep the commandments of God is because we're wanting to walk along with one foot in the light and one foot in the dark. Walking in the light is incompatible with walking in worldliness. If a man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Amen. Boy, I'm preaching folks out of church tonight. Am I not telling right? John said that. If you love the world, you do not love the Father. The reason Demas wasn't that got sidetracked because he loved this present world. And if all you can think about is what you can nail down in this present world, brother, you're walking in the dark. And if you be risen with Christ, you need to seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Preacher, I see that my life and God's book don't line up. Where do I go? Well, I want to tell you where you don't go. You don't go to some little old booth built up there to listen to a man and tell him about what you've been doing wrong. 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 5 said there is one God and one mediator between man and God and that's the man Christ Jesus. That's not your pastor. That's not your Sunday school teacher. That's not your father. That's not your bishop. That's not your archbishop. That's not your cardinal. That's not your pope. There is one mediator between God and man, and that man is Jesus Christ. Hebrews 4, 14, our great high priest has passed into the heaven. Amen. 
Take your burden, take, take your problem, take your trouble to the Lord. Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. When the world from you withholds of its silver and its gold and you have to get along on meager fare. Amen. Remember in his word how he feeds the little bird. Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. He's one that can do something about it. I can't. I'd like to be able to. Wouldn't it be great if I had apostolic authority? I don't think it would. I'll tell you why I don't think it would. Because there was a man in hell that got real evangelistic. And he said if you'd send somebody back from the dead, they'd believe. Amen. If we had these apostles here, we'd believe. No, we wouldn't. God sent one back from the dead and they still don't believe. Amen. Then whenever you go to confess your sin, you need to be specific and not general. Amen. You know, it, it's cute and uh, 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 it's acceptable to say, Lord, forgive us of our sins. Amen. But very seldom you hear somebody on the altar saying, God, I'm a drunk. Help me. Amen. God, I'm an adulterer. Help me. Amen. Amen. God, I'm a liar. I'm a thief. I've been stealing your money. I got your tithe in my back pocket. Help me. You don't hear people talking like that. Because, see, we want to be general with it. Yeah, Yeah, forgive me of my sins. Which one? Uh, You know which one's shady. Amen. 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 You ought not to be proud of it. You ought to be ashamed of it. You ought to be sorry for it. And the Bible said you ought to be sorry for it. You like me to show it to you? Look in the book of Psalm chapter 38. Psalm chapter 38, verse 18. For I will declare mine iniquity... I will be sorry for my sin. Amen. We talk about spousal abuse, wife abuse. You know who the first wife abuser was? Adam. Because whenever he was faced with his sin, he said, I didn't do it. She did. It's her fault. No, actually, it's your fault because if you hadn't given her to me, I wouldn't have loved her so much. Uh Amen. So God, between you and Eve, I don't know which one, but ain't me. We fault our neighbor. We fault our brother. We fault our wife. We fault our children, our dad, our mommy. Everybody talks about, well, because they're abused children, they've done this. And the truth of the matter is you're a sinner because you like it. The Bible said that light come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds was evil. Cain blamed Abel. He was so angry at Abel because Abel was was accepted that he thought, man, I'll get rid of that loudmouth Baptist preacher. And he clubbed him to death. Don't cover it up. Proverbs 28, 13. If you confess your sins and forsake your sins. Amen. It may involve restitution. A man come to me one time and he said, Preacher, uh, I went up to the Hex, I think it was in those days. He said, I went in there and I stole a chainsaw. And the Lord has convicted me about this, Preacher. What should I do? I said, take it back. And this man said, they'll put me in jail. And I told him, you belong in jail. Is that right? Am I telling it right? Amen. Amen. Sometimes it involves restitution. Zacchaeus knew that. When Zacchaeus come down that tree, he said, if I've taken anything by false... uh, 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 accusation he said I'll restore it fourfold didn't he say I'll not only pay him what it's worth I'll pay him four times what it's worth what he knew and what a lot of Americans don't know is that sin is costly 
And sometimes it costs you. I know you've heard this old Baptist saying, it costs you more than you're wanting to pay. It takes you further than you want to go. It keeps you longer than you planned to stay. And I'm telling you, sin is costly in your life. Were you aware that there's a high price for sin? The Bible said the wages of sin is death. Amen. 